want to learn how to manage your own investments? Are you ready to stop paying investment management fees and start building wealth? The DIY Investing Podcast is dedicated to providing you with the knowledge, skills, and resources you need to be a better investor. Learn how to make investments through the use of fundamental analysis, mental models, and business management insights. Now, here's your host, value investing expert, Trey Henninger. Hello and welcome to the DIY Investing Podcast. My name is Trey Henniger and I'm your host. In today's episode, I want to discuss stock valuation and a rule of thumb I use to quickly value investment ideas. Before I get started, I want to remind everyone listening to the podcast on YouTube to please like and subscribe to the channel in order to receive more content in the future. If you're listening to this on the podcast, please leave a rating and review to the podcast that helps me to grow the shot podcast audience and I greatly appreciate it. So let's dive on in. So today's episode, I'm going to discuss earnings yield on cost. And this is a valuation rule of thumb that I like to use when I make my investments and I work through investing research. Today's topic of conversation came to me as an idea when I was trying to explain to someone asking me a question about why they should buy or not buy Amazon stock. Now, you might be listening to this podcast, you might own Amazon stock. Um, this is not meant to talk anything, one thing specifically about Amazon. I will be using it as one of my examples, but we're going to use examples including Amazon, Apple, Discover Financial, Financial, and NACO to discuss this rule of thumb and see how it can help you make quick decisions on whether a stock is worth further research, worth further valuation work, because it's a good way to quickly assess whether a company is undervalued or overvalued. You see, in our last episode, we discussed that the sources of investment returns. In this episode, we're going to dive deeper into the nuance of stock valuation. And here, I want to clarify what a rule of thumb is. A rule of thumb is a simple reference point method to quickly determine whether a stock is overvalued or undervalued. So here, our valuation rule of thumb is not a substitute for valuation, but simply a starting point to allow you to focus and prioritize your time on the ideas that appear to be good values. When you do research on a company, it takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of effort to dive in, learn about the business, evaluate whether it's a high quality business or a low quality business, evaluate whether the valuation makes sense, and simply evaluating whether to dedicate your time to begin the research process on a company is worth doing. There are tens of thousands of companies available for you to invest in. You don't have to invest in every one. You only have to invest in the companies that are going to make you money. What that means is it makes sense to focus on the companies that are obviously undervalued and as a corollary, but not the same thing, it also makes sense to ignore companies that are obviously overvalued. And this rule of thumb is to help you sort through the tens of thousands of companies out there to find the ones that are going to fit your investment philosophy. As a value investor, you're trying to buy stocks for prices that are lower than what they're worth. What that means is you need to have some quantitative objective measure that allows you to determine whether a stock is worth buying. But it also means early on in the research process, it's valuable to have a quantitative method to sort these companies. And that's where we are today. So what we want to use is the earnings yield on cost. And Before we can get into the earnings yield on cost, we need to begin with a reminder about what the earnings yield is. The earnings yield is a percentage number. And that percentage is calculated by dividing current earnings by the current stock price. So you take the total earnings and you divide it by the stock price or total market valuation. Um, and it's quite simple to do. So if a company is earning $10 per share and they have a $100 stock price, then 10 divided by 100 is 10%. That's your earnings yield. If they have a $10 
current earnings and they have a $200 stock price, then 10 divided by 200 is 5%. And you have a 5% earnings yield. So it's pretty simple math. We're just dividing one number by another. But that's how you calculate the earnings yield. Now, earnings yield on cost is slightly different. Earnings yield on cost has the same two numbers. You still have earnings divided by stock price, but those earnings are no longer current earnings. Those earnings are current, past, or future earnings. But mainly we're focusing here today on future earnings. As in, in the future, they will be current earnings, but today they don't yet exist. We want to know what a company is going to earn in the future, so this requires making some guess, guesses and estimate. But as I'll get into, this is pretty simple and straightforward to do. We're trying to just make a quick pass when we're trying to value this company. The second piece is stock price, of course. Now, the stock price is not the current stock price. The stock price is the original purchase price for that stock. So now if you're trying to buy a stock today, it will be the current stock price. You're going to evaluate the earnings yield on cost, assuming you were to buy the company today at the current price. So if a company's trading at $100 per share, you evaluate the earnings yield on cost by assuming you buy the company at $100 per share. And then the future earnings part is your estimate of what feasible possible future earnings are. And those are your two categories here for earnings yield on cost. And what you'll see as we walk through this, we're not actually doing this calculation to much detail. We're going to be focusing on inverting it. We don't care so much about predicting future earnings. Predicting future earnings is hard. What we do care about is evaluating whether the number required to receive our rule of thumb is possible or feasible. And that's what we're gonna do. So it's we're taking this earnings yield on cost and we're gonna kind of invert it. And the only way to explain that is to go to this next step of what I wanna talk about and just explain what my rule of thumb is. So my rule of thumb is that your earnings yield on cost for an investment must exceed 10% in order to earn a 10% rate of return on your investments due to the business performance of the stock. So this ignores speculation. It ignores earning return based upon a rising multiple of price to earnings. So we're not going to focus on trying to get a a speculative gain because other people are bidding up the stock. We're simply going to focus on how much business performance can this company provide me? And will that business performance be able to provide me a 10% rate of return? So why 10%? So my focus here for this rule of thumb begins with, it's basically a specific case for a general investment rule. And the general investment rule applies very broadly. And so you can adjust this rule of thumb to whatever your discount rates are. But there's an investment rule here that in order for any business, any stock, doesn't matter which stock it is, but a stock must eventually trade at an earnings yield on cost equal to your discount rate in order to earn your required return on capital for you as an investor. So that's our rule for today. Stocks must eventually trade at an earnings yield on cost equal to your discount rate in order to earn your required return on capital for you as an investor. So what does this mean? All I'm doing is I'm saying, okay, my discount rate's 10%. I've talked about that in past episodes. I like to use 10% discount rate. I think it adequately justifies my spending time working on investing. It adequately allows me to earn a sufficient return to meet my financial goals. Your escape rate might be different, might be 8%, might be 12%. You can plug in your number as you have it, or you can simply use my 10% because we're focusing here as a rule of thumb. This is not valuation. This is simply a shortcut method to evaluate whether a stock is worth researching. So what I'm saying here is that if I want to buy a stock, the earnings yield on cost that that I gave the formula for just before must eventually exceed that 10% discount rate, or it must eventually match the 10% discount rate in order to allow me to say a company is undervalued 
or capable of being an investment in my portfolio. So I could talk for days about this, but what I'm trying to get at is pretty simple, but I think the best way to understand is to dive into these examples. And before I do that examples, I just want to talk one more time and say, what we're focusing on here is the fundamental business performance. You can make money, as I talked about in the last episode, many different ways. But if you're a value investor, you typically are trying to get money from business performance. You're trying to buy businesses. You're not worried about stocks as a stock, as a piece of paper. You're focused on buying businesses. And when you buy a business, you want to buy a good business, but you want to buy a business that is capable of giving you a return on your money while protecting your principal. So this rule of thumb is ignoring that benefit of speculation. It's ignoring gains that you can receive simply because people are bidding the business higher. This is focused on, can the business itself give me the return I need? So let's dive into examples. I have four examples for you today that I think will help you understand this rule of thumb and how I use it in my investing process. So I haven't looked in detail at all these companies, and that will be apparent as I talk through them, but some of them I have looked in detail, and I think that will also be apparent as I talk through them. So our first example is the one that prompted me to make this episode, and it's the one where I received the question. So I received a question and said, hey, should I buy Amazon? Is Amazon a good buy? Having not done a lot of research on Amazon, um, I used my rule of thumb and I said no. And the reason was this. I look at Amazon and the market cap is $1.22 trillion. Now for the purpose of this episode, we're ignoring debt. Debt is very important, but this is a rule of thumb. This is not valuation. In a true valuation, you'll take debt into account to get the enterprise value and that becomes very important as you look at this. But We're just trying to do a first pass. Is this company worth looking at or is it worth passing on for now because it's obviously overvalued or obviously undervalued? So Amazon has a market cap of $1.2 trillion. Or another way of saying that is Amazon has a market cap of $1,200 billion. So we know the stock price is $1,200 billion. So how much did they earn last year? This is the second step. You go get the market cap. How much would it cost to buy the entire company? And then you figure out, okay, well, what were the earnings? In 2019, Amazon earned $11.5 billion. So now we have $11.5 billion as the numerator for our earnings yield. And we have $1,200 billion as the denominator of our earnings yield. And the result is that the earnings yield is 0.9%. So the current earnings yield for Amazon is 0.9%. But our rule of thumb is earnings yield on cost. So we're not limited to the current earnings yield. Now, the current earnings yield is substantially below my 10% target. It's over an order of magnitude below my 10% target. So what does this mean? I need the earnings to be much higher in order to justify Amazon being a good investment. So if I want to buy Amazon today, we're going to invert this equation and say, how do I get to a 10% earnings yield for Amazon? How does Am- how much money does Amazon need to earn in profit in a single year to justify the current market price? Because I'm considering a current purchase of the stock. And for me, I look at that and say, okay, it's worth $1,200 billion today. You take 10% of that and it's $120 billion. So in order to justify Amazon's current market price, in the future, at some point, they need to earn $120 billion a year. Doesn't need to be this year, doesn't need to be next year, doesn't need to be the year after that. But at some point, in order for Amazon to provide a 10% return to its current shareholders, without taking into account speculation, Amazon needs to earn $120 $120 billion per year in profit. And they need to be able to distribute that money as dividends to its shareholders without impacting their business. And if they don't, then the number needs to be higher. Also, for every year that it takes for them to reach that $120 billion mark, 
that 120 billion mark actually rises because when we think about what real valuation means, it's a discounted cash flow. So any money we receive in the future is worth less than today. So that's $120 billion of net present value. So if they don't meet $120 billion today, that means that next year the target is now $130 billion or $132 billion, you know, going up by 10% because that's my discount rate. So I sit there and for my rule of thumb, I say, okay, Amazon is currently valued at $1,200 billion. Do I think it's feasible that within the next five to 10 years, Amazon could earn $120 billion? And the five to 10 years is very important. When you think about what a 10% discount rate means, that means that in seven years, your money needs to double. When I think about this, it also means that in a seven year time frame, or if we broaden it a little bit and say five to 10 year time frame, the difficulty level or the earnings required to achieve my rate of return is also going to double. That means sometime in the next five to 10 years, Amazon shouldn't be earning simply $120 billion, but they should probably be earning somewhere in the range of $240 billion, which is twice that number. If I'm not going to get that $120 billion today. So, but then that becomes really hard to achieve. So I'm simply saying, I'm not going to, force Amazon to meet that target of $240 billion seven years from now. But I am going to say, I can't give them more than five to 10 years to hit that $120 billion profit mark, because otherwise the discounting for those future earnings has been reduced so much. It's basically been cut in half that it's not as valuable to me. So it doesn't help me for Amazon to earn $120 billion a hundred years from now or 40 years from now. They need to earn earn it relatively soon in order to justify their current market cap. So when I answer, I don't think that Amazon is a good stock to purchase today. It's not based upon any deep understanding of the company or their growth rates. I simply look and say, do I think it's feasible for Amazon to 10x their earnings in the next five to 10 years? Do I think they're going to have $120 billion in profit five years from now? And my answer is no. I think it's too difficult for them to move from their current 0.9% earnings yield up to a 10% earnings yield by reaching $120 billion. So for me, this rule of thumb says quick pass on Amazon. It's not worth further research because it's simply too highly priced. Next example, Apple. Apple is more valuable as a company than Amazon, but I think you'll see why when we go through this. So their current market cap is $1.38 trillion or 1380 billion. But their 2019 earnings were 55 billion. So Amazon or Apple is worth about 10% more than Amazon in terms of the total company, but they earn five times as many profits. So that's 55 billion in profit compared to 11 billion in profit. So the earnings yield of Apple is substantially higher. The current earnings yield is 3.9%. So instead of 0.9%, we're at 3.9%, basically 4%. So Amazon was basically 1%. They needed to 10x their earnings to reach the 10% marker. Apple is at around 4%. They need a two and a half times their earnings. Now that still means that Apple needs to grow their earnings from 55 billion to 138 billion sometime within the next 10 years. Can they do that? Now, what would that mean? So if we say that they're going to grow their earnings from 55 billion to 138 billion in the next 10 years, that requires about a 10% rate of return in their earnings growth. In other words, 9.64%. So Apple needs to compound their earnings at 9.64% in order to eventually hit a market cap or uh, an earnings that can justify their current market cap. Now that doesn't justify a higher market cap. That's not saying in 10 years when their earnings are at 138 billion that they should have a $3 trillion company. Now that might be what happens to the stock, but that simply justifies the current day marking cap. So Apple needs to grow their earnings at a fairly fast rate. You're talking about an extra 5 billion a year compounded. So 5 billion next year, maybe 6 billion the year after that. And they need to 
grow faster than that. They can't simply grow at 10% a year. They have to grow faster than that because every year that it takes them to reach that target, the target actually grows by 10%. So they need to be growing their earnings probably by about 20% a year in order to eventually hit our 10% earnings yield in a time that justifies the current market price. So if someone were to ask me today, is Apple justified to be trading at this price? I'd have to say no. It might work out for investors, but it's hard for me to see a future where Apple is able to grow to $138 billion in earnings within the next 10 years. Now, this is where, contrary to Amazon, where people might say, oh, well, they're growing fast, but I agree, it's kind of hard to hit $120 billion, 10x in 10 years. It's possible, but it's hard. You might have more disagreement on Apple, and that's because the earnings yield today is closer to our target earnings yield on cost. Now, I think it's too low to justify it, but you're starting to get in the range where there can be disagreement. If, for instance, your earnings yield on cost target was 8% because your discount rate was 8% instead of 10%, well, now you only require the earnings to double in 10 years. That's pretty feasible. But again, it's only justifying the current price. When you take into account the fact that you have to discount those future cash flows, it starts to get harder and harder to achieve. Can it be done? Yes. Apple's an extraordinary company and they earn a lot of money. But it's very, very hard to grow when you're already the largest, most profitable company in the world. So I think that shows those two as an example. Now we're going to dive into some that are in the other category. Some that pass my mark of being potentially an obvious undervalued pick. So both Amazon and Apple would fail my target rule of thumb. And now I'm going to have two examples that passed my target rule of thumb. This doesn't mean that these companies should be invested in. It simply means that my next two companies pass the rule of thumb and are worth further research. So our third example today is Discover Financial. Discover Financial is a bank. They issue credit cards, the Discover card. Um, they're one of four credit card networks um, that are based in the U.S. or worldwide. In the four networks, you've probably heard of all of them, Visa, MasterCard, American Express, and Discover. Discover is the fourth one, and they're the smallest one. Their market cap is $14.5 billion. So now we're much smaller than Apple. It's about 100 times smaller than Apple. But their 2019 earnings are $2.9 billion. So it's 100 times smaller, but only 20 times less profitable. So what does that mean? If you have $2.8 billion and you divide it by $14.5 billion market cap, the current earnings yield based on 2019 earnings for Discover Financial is 20%. So now immediately you see that my current earnings yield exceeds my earnings yield on cost target of 10%, 20% bigger than 10%. This doesn't mean I should buy Discover but it means when I think about what the earnings yield on cost is trying to do, what I'm trying to do with earnings yield on cost is say, is there a possible future in within the next five to 10 years where I think Discover will be earning at least a 10% earnings yield on my purchase price? That would require at some point in the next five to 10 years, Discover to earn $1.4 billion in profit each year. Well, last year, they earned $2.9 billion in profit, but they only need them to earn $1.4 billion in profit. So when I sit there and look at that, I say, okay, because in the past, as recently as last year, they've earned at least $1.5 billion because they earned $2.9 billion, I can justify Discover being a candidate that I do further research on. It's very easy for me to see that Discover is going to be able to grow their earnings back to $2.9 billion because they did it most recently in the past. Now, why is it the earnings yield 20%? Well, in large part, it's because we're currently in a recession in the United States and a recession globally. I'm not sure it's been officially announced, but there's broad agreement that there is a current recession here in May 2020 as I record this podcast. Um, recording in May 30th, um, 2020 for everyone's reference. So people say, okay, well, they're not going to earn $2.9 billion in 2020. 
Maybe they lose money in 2020. Maybe they do. I don't know. I'm not trying to predict what they're going to earn today or next year or the year after. This rule of thumb is simply to say, is it possible, and not just possible, but is it feasible and probable that in the next five years, they'll be earning at least $1.5 billion each year? And I would say yes. For Discover, even if their earnings are negative this year because of the recession, five years from now, I don't see any reason that they won't be earning at least $1.5 billion, let alone maybe reaching their old 2019 earnings of $2.9 billion. So their stock price has cratered because of the recession and the thought that credit card default rates will rise, which is fine. That makes sense. It's a good thesis. But the piece that we're looking at for this rule of thumb is, is it worth some further look? Is it worth further research? And anytime you see an earnings yield, a current earnings yield that exceeds your earnings yield on cost target, here we have 20% exceeding our 10% target, then it's worth further research. It's worth researching that company and trying to do a more formal valuation to determine whether it's worth the risk. So I would say here, Discover Financial passes my screen. This brings me to one more example. So NACO. NACO is uh, ticker NC. We've talked about it before on the podcast. We've talked about it in an interview with Jeff Gannon um, that I did, who hosts the Focus Compounding podcast. Um, We've talked about it before. But basically, NACO, we're going to use the same screening tool. So what's the current earnings divided by the stock price? So in 2019, NACO earned $39 million. Their current stock price represents a market cap of $184 million. So you see in each of these examples, we're going down smaller and smaller companies. But when you divide $39 million of earnings divided by the current market cap of $184 million, you get an earnings yield of 21.2%. So again, I look at this, does this pass my earnings yield on cost rule of thumb? And the quick answer is yes. It exceeds the current earnings yield on cost, which means that I'm receiving more than my 10% target. Now, again, in 2020, the thought is that the earnings are going to drop. That's the only way that you get an earnings yield so distorted like this. It's not common to see a 20, it's not common to see a current earnings yield exceeding 20%, let alone it's not common to see current earnings yield exceeding 10%. So the thought process is that in 2020, the earnings are not going to be as high as 39 million they're going to be lower. Now, if you ask me to guess, I think the earnings are going to exceed 18 million, which means that the earnings are likely to still meet my earnings yield on cost for 2020. So this is a better situation than Discover Financial, but I'm not sure. So even if we say 2020, we don't meet our target of 18 million because 18 million is 10% of the 184 million market cap. The question we ask ourselves in this rule of thumb is simple. Do I see NACO in the next five to 10 years earning on average or higher than $18 million per year? And the answer is yes. So NACO passes my screen. I realize now as I get to the end of this podcast recording that it would have been good to have an example where the current earnings yield is lower than 10%, but it does pass the screen of the earnings yield on cost. And What you'd be looking for there, because I don't have the example here today, is basically you'd be looking for something like an earnings yield of 8%. Current earnings yield is 8%. This is equivalent to about a PE of 12 or 13. And at that earnings yield, you say, okay, how do I grow to meet a 10% earnings yield on cost? Well, if you're at 8% already, and you only need to get to 10%, then you need to grow your earnings by 25%. How hard is it to grow your earnings by 25% total over a five-year period? Well, if it's over a five-year period and you assume no compounding, then it's only growing earnings by 5% a year. A lot of companies can grow their earnings at 5% a year. That's a very common thing to be able to do. And if you're growing faster than 5% a year, then it's even more feasible. So what earnings yield on cause would help you then is to say, okay, I can see a clear path where my earnings yield on cost over the next five years will grow from 8% to 10%. It only requires a 5% growth rate. 
During those five years, I know I'm eventually going to have a business that's going to be able to meet my target market cap or target earnings yield on cost of 10%. Uh, you can still achieve this with stuff like a 6% or a 7% earnings yield on cost, but it's going to require a slightly faster growth rate. So when um, an 8% earnings yield required a 5% growth rate, um, a 7% earnings yield is going to require closer to a 10% growth rate to meet that target in five years. But it's still achievable. When you drop below 5% earnings yields, which is basically a PE of 20 for the current earnings yield, it becomes very difficult to see this earnings yield on cost quickly hitting 10%. It would require exceedingly fast growth. You're talking about growth that, it, growth that exceeds 20% per year. Is that achievable? Yes, for some companies, but it's not obviously achievable for every company. So the point of this episode is to simply give you a tool, a tool to help you speed up your investing research, to focus your research on the companies that are going to be most helpful for you, and to focus in on companies that are obviously undervalued or undervalued. The overvalued ones you can simply push aside. It's not worth wasting your time on companies that may only be slightly overvalued or appear to be overvalued but may not be overvalued. There are enough companies out there that are obviously undervalued that you can focus on your research in. When you focus only on companies that are obviously undervalued, then all you have to do is wean out the ones that are bad. And eventually you're left with the ones that are good. And that's an easier job than trying to wean through the overvalued companies that are good enough to justify that overvaluation. I hope this episode has been helpful for you today. I want to stick to this final point of reminder. The earnings yield on cost must eventually exceed your discount rate in order to justify an investment in the company. Because in order to receive your required rate of return, in our example, 10%, the earnings yield has to exceed that 10% rate because the earnings is the source of your dividends. Now here, earnings and cash flow can be synonymous. I'm using earnings because it's simple to look up and pull data from. But basically, if you want to be able to receive dividends on your yield, like a dividend yield on cost of at least 10%, at some point in the future. The only way that is achievable is if the earnings yield on cost eventually exceeds 10%, which means that the company is able to start beginning to pay dividends at a rate that can justify your investment. If a company is unable to, sometime within the next five to 10 years, achieve an earnings yield on cost of 10% or greater, I would quickly pass on the company because you have plenty of other investments that will meet that hurdle. I hope this episode is helpful. I hope you can benefit from the earnings yield on cost rule of thumb to help you quickly winnow through ideas and improve your investing process. This is what I do to improve my own investing process. It's helped me to be more efficient with my time, but also to make sure that I'm being sufficiently (sighs) prudent in finding ideas that are worth my time. Because When you buy a stock, that stock has to be better than the stocks currently in your portfolio. And if you're using similar processes over and over and over again, it's going to be very hard to justify buying a company at something like a 20 times earnings yield when, or a 20 times PE ratio, when most of the companies in your portfolio are much lower at like a 10%, 10%, 10 times PE ratio or less. So, focus on using this rule of thumb to improve your investing process. It doesn't substitute for valuation, but I think it's a good first step to help you determine whether a company is worth your time to research. So thank you for listening to this episode. The full show notes for this episode, including my outline for today's podcast, are available at diyinvesting.org slash episode 78. Please remember this is a listener-supported podcast. If you've gained value from today's content, please consider supporting the show financially as a patron. You can become a patron at DIYinvesting.org slash P-A-T-R-O-N. Your financial support is what allows me to continue creating this free investment content without any advertisements. If you choose to become a patron of the show, you'll receive exclusive insights into my personal investing process through the DIYinvesting.org membership program. 
Once again, you can find out more information at DIYinvesting.org slash P-A-T-R-O-N. If you're listening to the podcast on YouTube, don't forget to like and subscribe. And if you're listening to the podcast on any other platform, please remember to leave a rating and review. Your ratings and review help me to grow the podcast audience. Thank you for listening. And until next time, stop paying fees, start building wealth. Thank you for listening to the DIY Investing Podcast. Please visit our website and subscribe to our email list at DIYinvesting.org for guides, videos, and resources to help make you a better investor. The DIY Investing Podcast is presented for general informational and entertainment purposes only. I have not considered your specific situation or risk profile, and I have not provided investment advice. The information presented on the DIY Investing Podcast should not be construed as investment advice. The views and opinions expressed on the DIY Investing Podcast are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's host or sponsors. DIY Investing, its producers, sponsors, and host, Trey Henniger, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based upon information or viewpoints presented on the DIY Investing Podcast.